Our service of Holy Eucharist, right, too, begins on page 355 of the Book of Common Prayer. Page 355. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, from whom all good proceeds, grant that by your inspiration we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding may do them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the book of Genesis. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Lord, the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God, call, God called to the man and said, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, What is it that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offsprings and hers. He will strike your head and you will strike his heels. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm today is 130. Um, if, could you please read responsively uh, her half verse? Out of the depths have I called you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. If you, Lord, were to note what is done amiss. O Lord, who could stand? For there is forgiveness with you. Therefore you shall be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for him. In his word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. More than watchman for the morning. 
O Israel, wait for the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy. With him there is plenteous redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. Second reading today is a reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed, so I spoke. We believe, and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus, and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as extended to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So do not lose heart, for even our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that the earthly tent we live in is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory be to you, Lord Christ. The crowd came together again so that Jesus and his disciples could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him, and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Please be seated. It's great to come together for a picnic day. It's great to see everybody. Um, it's interesting that here on this day, when we as a congregation are coming together to enjoy our first meal together in over a year, think about that. This, we've always been really proud of our meals together and the fellowship we have, and it's, it's been over a year since we've been able to enjoy that, and, and we get to do it today. It's wonderful. And on this day, the gospel reading begins with this strange phenomenon that so many people came to Jesus and his disciples with such pressing needs that they could not even eat. Oh, may the time come when the world around us and the neighbors in these homes and the city of O'Fallon and the people of the Metro East should so desire the power and presence of Christ, displaying himself among us at St. Michael's, that they would throng the Episcopal Church on the Windy Hill in such an inconvenient way. And so press us to pray for them and preach to them and offer them the holy sacraments that we would not even be able to put on a simple church picnic. And I know for me calling it simple, Bill's, <laughs> Bill, <laughs> who's, who's put on all, all so much work to organize it and organize the volunteers and everyone, uh, you're going to tell me it's not so simple. This is true. This is true. Thank you to everyone who's helped put it together. Uh, note also that this crowd that thronged our Lord came together without the use of the Internet, without email, without the 24-hour news cycle, without telephones, without automobiles, even without a postal system. They only had one method of communication and only one method of transportation, by mouth and by foot. Today, such a ministry strategy would be considered a perfect storm of terrible ideas, a losing market strategy, a public relations failure. <laughs> May we attain this level of failure, the kind of failure that brings such crowds to your door that you can't even eat. Later on, of course, Jesus will say when his uh, disciples are with him by the well in Samaria and they press him to eat food, he says that he has food to eat that you know not of, and his food is to do the will of his Father in heaven. There before him, even when he couldn't eat the physical food, what a scrumptious spiritual buffet was on the menu for him to do the will of his Father in teaching and preaching and healing the multitudes. May God give us a palate for this spiritual food. May our hearts be so formed to intensely desire the spread of his gospel that an interruption in our meal schedule becomes the least of our concerns. May the presence of Christ to us and to our broken and hurting neighbors be our very sustenance, the word of God, our life-giving drink. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The ironies continue in this gospel reading. We see three groups that uh, reject Jesus, that express their opposition to him. Uh, those groups are the ones who are closest to him, uh, then the religious scholars, and then his own family. And each group seems to have a good reason for what they're doing, at least according to conventional social and religious reasoning. But each group is wrong in a significant way, and their reasons betray their failure to grasp who this Jesus is that they're confronted with. First, those who are nearest to Jesus try to restrain him because they say he is beside himself. That's literally what the Greek word means. It means standing beside yourself. It's his family that restrain him, but it's not exactly the Greek word. The Greek word is those who are near him, those who are beside him, the people who are right there with him. Obviously, this could mean Jesus' family, except that Jesus' family really isn't very close to him, uh, with possibly the exception of his mother, um, not physically or emotionally. Right? In fact, this is the only place in the whole Gospels that we see this whole group come together. So I think this description probably applies to a different group. This is, uh, I think, most likely Jesus' friends or uh, the people who are giving him hospitality where he's staying at the moment, the people who are close to him in the immediate moment. They think he's out of his mind. What did he say? What did he do that made them think that? 
As far as we know, it's just the, the fact that he's drawing such a big crowd. The irony here is in the fact that those who are closest to Jesus claim that he's beside himself. I uh, listened to a podcast on my way home from vacation. I like to listen to something talking on the radio rather than, than music. And um, though I, we were listening to a podcast about a recently deceased celebrity, and the people who were close to the celebrity were, were giving glowing reports of how this person was generous and gracious, uh, passionate about his work, and everybody caught that passion and, and really wanted to do what that person was doing. And it's interesting that here with Jesus, we get just the opposite, right? Those who are closest to him, those who are working alongside him, seem to be the first to misunderstand him, to be passionate in other directions than Jesus is, and to have in mind a very different mission. And that's, again, the irony, that we as readers, when we read this in the gospel, we understand better than them what Jesus' mission really was, how he was passionate to do the Father's will, and then he does it all because he's the Son of God, the Messiah, the Lord, who is giving himself for the life of the world. We as readers know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, to the end that all that believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But the people who were closest to Jesus, even right beside him in his ministry, can't see that. Not yet. They think he's crazy. We want that kind of crazy, right? We want those who are closest to us to think, what's gotten into them? They're taking this religion thing so seriously. We know 2,000 years later that such a rejection means we're following the king whose kingdom is not of this world, whose values turn those of this world on their head. We keep alive the tradition of these very disciples who will later be called the men who have turned the world upside down. We know that when Jesus says, blessed are the poor, the meek, the hungry, those who mourn, those who are persecuted, that he's right, that there is a blessing for those in the kingdom of God who suffer these things. We have the advantage over these friends of Jesus who, who turn against him because we have the Holy Spirit inside us, leading us into all truth, and two millennia of reflection by spirit-filled Christians to help us see the way. We can see that this kind of crazy is the right kind of crazy, the kind that will save the world from its sins and share the love of God by mouth and by foot all across the globe. We want this kind of crazy. The second group that rejects Jesus are the religious scholars. Very well-reasoned example, right? They're, notice that their reasoning is purely theoretical. They have no conscious and direct experience of demons, or demons fighting demons. <laughs> but some tenured know-it-all up at Pharisee University, thinking he's clever, came up with a neat intellectual solution to the puzzle of Jesus. What if he casts out demons by the prince of the demons? <laughs> of course, yes, that makes sense. It's amazing how, no matter how dumb the argument is, the if it gives the world a, a, a chance to conceive of itself without God, the intellectual types will go for it. Think about it. Why else would we believe that life on this planet came from non-life rather than from a creator? Right? We have exactly zero examples of life following something that isn't already alive. Zero examples in nature. Over more than 200 years of scientists looking for it to happen, trying to make it happen in laboratories, hoping desperately to make it to happen. And yet our most intellectual folks continue to insist that this must have been the case. Right? That's not just anti-God, that's anti-science, honestly. Science is about observation, right? Life comes from life, always. But because it's anti-God, we go for it, right? It's the same phenomenon Jesus is dealing with here. These PhD Pharisees are quick to believe the worst idea, not because it makes any sense, but because it gives them the out that they want. It takes Jesus about 30 seconds to destroy this argument. And half of that is probably spent shaking his head at how it just doesn't make any sense. No divided kingdom can long endure. 
No divided house can stand. If Satan is casting out Satan, hey guys, that's a win. Right? That's a win for everyone. Y'all should be happy. But then Jesus says, that's not really what's going on here. What's going on here, if you want to know, is that no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he has first conquered the strong man. No one can cast out demons unless he's stronger than the demons. Get your intellectual heads out of the sand and see the truth that the Son of Man standing in front of you is also the Son of God. He casts out demons because he's defeated the demons. He conquers the devil just by showing up. He casts out sickness because he is God, the healer, and because by his stripes we are healed. He remakes those who are broken because he is God, the creator. He preaches because he is God's word. He leads us as his disciples because he is king of kings. He comforts us because he is the prince of peace. He guides us because he is the wonderful counselor. He forgives our sins because he dies for our sins. He raises the dead because he rises from the dead. He makes us whole because in him we are whole. He is the Son of God, the Lord of life, the eternal second person of the Trinity. God himself made flesh in dwelling among us. Cast down your intellectual arguments and simply experience him for yourself, Jesus is saying. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. The final group that opposes Jesus in this passage is his own family. His brothers or half-brothers, if you take the Catholic look at it, or, and his sisters or half-sisters. And this is quite a... Gospels do we see this whole group coming together, except when they're coming together to reject Jesus. Maybe some of you have families like that, <laughs> that never seem to get together uh, unless something really bad happens. Right? Here's this family, this complicated family, come together for the first time in who knows how long, united where perhaps there was previously only division, led by some dominant will that far more concerned with family pride than for the work of God, such that even the Blessed Virgin Mary lends her support to the group. I don't think she's leading this group. I think they convinced her to go along with it. And they make the trip together to wherever Jesus is at this time, and they find him surrounded by this crowd that won't even let him eat. They have to send a messenger inside because they can't get to him. Shut it down, Jesus, they say. This is family talking. And of course, in their culture, the will of your family was a very powerful influence. It's time to come home, they say. Stop this troublemaking. Your family is calling. Now remember, when Jesus was 12 years old and lost in the temple, his mother and father told him to come home, and it says he submitted himself to them. Perhaps they expect to see the same dutiful son here. But Jesus is an adult now. Now his mission is to follow his father at all costs. Now he has a new family, those who do the will of his father in heaven. Now his identity as the son of Mary must pale in comparison to his identity as the son of God. Or rather, let's say it this way, now his identity as the son of Mary must itself be transformed by the very fact that he is the son of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only son to become this word made flesh, to take on human nature, to become one of us so that we could become one with God. Thus, what it means for Jesus to be the son of Mary, the brother of these brothers, the brother of these sisters, is no longer a matter of just belonging to an earthly family or following their authority or, or giving their will priority over God's will. Now being the son of Mary means that Jesus can save all humanity in every family, every country, every race, every culture, through every language, by his cross and resurrection, by his incarnation and ascension, by word of mouth and travelers afoot, by preaching and teaching and healing, by sacraments and by eating, yes, even the physical operation that this crowd is preventing him from doing, eating and drinking in themselves become the vehicles through which God's saving power can come to the world. 
Jesus will not let even his own family dissuade him from accomplishing this mission. If they're socially embarrassed by what he's doing, so be it. Therefore, when Jesus tells us that we must be willing to hate father and mother and family for his sake, when he wants this congregation of God, the community of disciples, to be our new family, he means it because he's lived it. This means that we don't get saved because of our racial or kinship ties. We aren't saved because of the social group to which we belong. God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. No, we are saved in only one way, by the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and by believing that God so loved us, even us, each one, that he gave his son for us. This new family is a family of believers. Anyone can belong because anyone can hear and believe. If this is social embarrassment, we want that kind of embarrassment. If a church like that, is, like we've just described, is too lowbrow, then we want lowbrow. If worshiping God is too undignified for the intellectual types, then like King David, we should say we will become yet more undignified than this. Because the Son of God did not let his dignity and position get in the way of our salvation. So today is our picnic. Picnics are family affairs. But this is our new family, our Christian family, a community of believing disciples who follow Jesus. Anyone can come to our picnic, anyone can come to our church, because here everyone and anyone is fed with the real spiritual food. Here we cultivate the right kind of crazy. Here we experience Jesus through more than just the intellect. Here we give ourselves wholly to the worship of God, who gave himself wholly for our salvation, caring not whether the world thinks highly of us. That's what our church family is built on. And anyone, even you watching and listening, can join us in this journey. Amen. We stand as we proclaim our common faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, found on page 358 of the Book of Common Prayer, page 358. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Prayers of the People are Form 3 in the Book of Common Prayer, beginning on page 387. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. Remembering especially Daniel, our bishop, Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, and John, our priest. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for our diocese and all those assisting in the search for a new bishop. That, that we may attend to the voice of your spirit within us. We pray for our president, for all those who serve, and for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others, especially Alec, Robert, Grant, Anna Claire, Nick, Sue, Ted, Ken, Janice, Sister Joan, Carol, Adam, Gail, Marin, Amanda, Mike, and Ellen. Are there any others? Zulant family, Robert Zulant. I ask your thanksgiving for those celebrating birthdays this week, especially Rosemary, Steve, and Ron. Almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, and restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life, and bring us all to be of one heart and one mind within your holy church. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting Father, from whose hand comes all that we need for life and godliness, we thank you for the generous gifts of your people, for the advance of your kingdom and the maintenance of your church. In them your people proclaim their trust in your providence. In them we make provision for the poor and needy among us. In them we see that the same divine generosity by which you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son. Jesus Christ, to purchase our redemption. 
Through him we pray, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Walk in love as Christ has loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we consecrate here to your service these stoles for the ministry of a deacon. May your blessing be upon them. May your blessing be upon the one who wears them, that he may always minister in faithfulness and godliness before your holy face. Through this we ask, all this we ask through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our great thanksgiving is Eucharistic Prayer A on page 361, page 361 of the Book of Common Prayer. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life, and you made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself, in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia! Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. 
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. And feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Our prayer after communion is found on page 365 of the Book of Common Prayer, page 365. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Please be seated. Today is a special day for lots of reasons. It's our annual parish picnic, which we're reinstituting today. Uh, thank you especially to Bill and to all those volunteers who have made this picnic possible. We're very grateful. Also, today is our annual meeting, and how this will work is uh, after the final hymn and dismissal. If you'll give me about five minutes to get these clothes off, uh, I will come back and we'll start the annual meeting. It shouldn't take us very long. All we have to do is elect new members to the mission leadership team and new delegates uh, to our synod. So um, that can be done pretty quickly. And then when we adjourn our annual meeting, then we'll all go right out and begin the picnic. Should be a great day. Uh, we have also here two stoles, two deacon stoles, for our own Mark Claimer. Mark, would you come up, please, and receive these from us? We're excited you're here today. We're excited for your ordination. Uh, may God always bless you and keep you and help you do ministry to the best of your ability, to the best of his ability. Thank you for having We're planning to have Mark come to us uh, some Sunday this summer and preach to us and uh, help at the altar and perform his functions as a deacon. So um, please do keep your eyes open for that in the calendar. Are there any other announcements that need to be made today? If not, then our final hymn is hymn number 569, 569.
in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia.